Hey everybody, this is Chris Serino, Vice President of Sultana Education Foundation. I wanna welcome you all to the first ever Sultana session. This is part of a six part lecture series that we're gonna be hosting this spring, uh, the first and third Thursdays in March, April, and May. So if you like what you see tonight, we hope you'll join us for future sessions. Tonight, you may have noticed I have this giant eight foot by 10 foot map created by Captain John Smith, really the first relatively accurate map ever made of the Chesapeake Bay. We're gonna be telling you everything near you could possibly ever wanna know about this map over the course of the next 25 to 30 minutes. If at any time you have questions about anything that I've said or you just wanna know more, you can go ahead and text in the chat to John Mann and my colleague who's helping sort of run the controls behind the scenes. Uh, and we really hope you enjoy tonight's program. So let's talk a little bit about this map. And then uh, what we're gonna do after I sort of give a little intro is we'll zoom in on different visual elements and kind of walk you around the whole map. So this, uh, prior to Smith's publishing of this map in 1612, earlier maps of the Bay really only showed it as like an inlet. There was almost no detail for any map that had ever been published prior to 1612. Uh, so Smith compiled information. Of course, he was part of the first settlement at Jamestown, arriving on the shores of what we today call the James River in 1607. And between 1607 and 1609, he traveled many thousands of miles, both overland and on the water. And along the way, he was taking sketches, making detailed notes of what he saw. And he returns to England and works with a cartographer named William Hole. And in 1612, he puts all of this information together in his masterpiece, which is behind me, which served as the de definitive rendering of the Chesapeake Bay from the year it was published in 1612 all the way until 1673. And that was a tumultuous time because a lot of thousands and thousands of people were coming over here from Europe. This really served as a blueprint for colonization of the area and obviously had tremendous cultural and ecological ramifications that still reverberate with us today. So John Mann's going to go ahead and zoom in on a high resolution uh, version of this map that we have. Uh, one thing that you'll notice is the map is pretty, it's pretty busy, right? It's got a lot going on. Um, the first thing that strikes uh, people as a little bit odd to the modern eye is it looks like Smith drew the map on its side, okay? So on this map, north is oriented to the right-hand side of the page. Now, why is that? This was typical of almost every early map ever made of the bay because it's drawn from a captain's eye view as you would have seen the entrance of the bay as you approached in ships, usually heading from Europe or other parts of the globe. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and, and zoom in on individual features. I'll tell you a little bit about each feature uh, and then we'll take a look at the bay itself and how Smith depicted it. So the first thing you'll notice here is that what we today would call the Atlantic Ocean, Smith labeled as the Virginian Sea. And Virginia, of course, refers to Queen Elizabeth I. Um, uh, she was also known as the Virgin Queen. So the sea here was named after Queen Elizabeth. You'll notice the, uh, the tall ship there, which is evocative of the style of vessels that the Jamestown settlers would have taken from England over to what they called the New World. Uh, one thing you'll also notice just above that ship, I get this is probably the thing people ask me about the most, is a sea monster. So right above that main mast is a sea monster. What is up with the sea monster? Why is that on the map? Were there sea monsters back in the day? The answer is no, there weren't sea monsters. That was a pretty normal strategy for old maps. It basically is there to draw your attention, to catch your eye, to make you zoom in. It's kind of like modern advertising. Like if you see a really nice commercial of someone drinking a nice cold Coke, you might be more inclined to drink that Coke and buy one at the store. Uh, if you see that sea monster and your eye is drawn to it, maybe it'll encourage you to take a look at other features on the map. So just to the left of that sea monster there is uh, the compass rose. You can actually see there's a symbol on the right-hand side that's called the Fleur de Lis, and that signifies north. So again, don't be thrown off by that. Smith drew this map with north to the right to match the view of sailors approaching the estuary by water. All right, so now we're gonna travel up to the upper left-hand corner of the map. There's a pretty famous scene that Smith wrote extensively about 
where he uh, actually was captured during a trading voyage up the Chickahominy River, which is a major tributary to the James River. And while Smith was on the Chickahominy River, he was captured by uh, a band of Native Americans that were hunting in the area. He was walked over land to a place called Werawakamako on today's York River. And he was introduced to the paramount chief that controlled really most of what we today would call Southwest, South and West Virginia. Um, and that is the scene that Smith describes when he wa was marched overland to uh, Chief Powhatan, where they had a ceremony. This is also the scene where allegedly uh, Smith believes he's about to have his brains beaten out by a couple of indigenous warriors and Pocahontas miraculously shows up and throws her body over his and saves his life. So on the map, Smith writes, Powhatan held this state in fashion when Captain Smith was delivered to him prisoner in 1607. Uh, so that's what that scene is. Uh, going from left to right, you'll notice there's a couple Native American tribes up in the mountains. The Monacan Indians were a Siouan speaking tribe that lived up at the headwaters of the James River. The Manahokes were another Siouan speaking tribe that lived at the head of the today's Rappahannock River. And you'll see this whole area was referred to as Virginia. So you might be asking, well, this is the Bay, right? What about, what about Maryland? What about Delaware? Well, Maryland wasn't established. You know, the colony wasn't founded until 1632. This map was published in 1612. And at this time, Virginia actually extended from what we today would call the Carolinas all the way up to New England. Uh, below that banner reading Virginia is the Royal Coat of Arms for Great Britain. Uh, remember, Smith is representing England on this voyage, the Virginia Company of London, to be exact. So he wanted to put the, that Royal Coat of Arms to denote, you know, who was sort of commanding this land here at the time. You'll see up in the upper right, this is a really, really important detail. And if you ever get a nice poster of this map, you really should check out this legend or key up here. Uh, when you look at this and read the words and check out the symbols, it really helps you kind of understand what is on this map. So Smith writes, signification of these marks to the crosses hath been discovered and what beyond is by relation. And you'll see that little Maltese cross there. And that's really critical. Every time Smith traveled up a river, he wouldn't necessarily go all the way to the head of that river, but he would let you know on the map by putting a little cross that marked the furthest extent of his travels. So if you see a river like the Potomac, for example, and you see a cross and then the river continues on beyond that, he's telling us that, hey, any part of that river beyond the cross I basically gleaned that information by speaking to the local Indian tribes, right? So uh, I don't know if, John, are you trying to scroll down to the Potomac? That's a really good example of that. So here, here's the Potomac River. You can see the Maltese cross there on a little hill, but then there's a lot of river beyond that. So you can surmise that Smith talked to the native communities on the Potomac. One thing that's kind of cool is he shows the Potomac splitting or forking right there. And if you're familiar with the Potomac River, that is where Harper's Ferry is located. So that is accurate, which is really amazing that he was able to, to get that much information over the course of really mostly just one summer in 1608. So let's go back to the key because uh, there's two other symbols that are really, really critical. Uh, and again, this is kind of also shows the English bias here when they're labeling these things. He shows these what he calls king's houses, which look like that symbol that looks like a little longhouse. The way a lot of these communities were set up along the rivers is there'd be multiple village sites, multiple communities, some smaller than others. And the larger ones would have a chief living at that community. And the smaller towns and the, the, the sub chiefs would often pay tribute to the paramount chief of a, of a local waterway. So Smith denotes sort of the larger towns with the important leaders as king's houses. And then these smaller communities he shows with a small circle with a dot in the middle, and he mapped over 230 Native American communities on this map. It's really an amazing piece of cartography if you want to learn about Native American settlement patterns prior to the arrival of Europeans. So let's go ahead and scroll down. Uh, one thing that really pops when you first look at this map is this character on the far right. This gentleman is a Susquehannock Indian warrior that Smith met at the head of the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, there's some really cool features there. You can obviously see he's holding a bow that's taller than he is. He's holding a wooden club in one hand. 
He's got a bare skin robe draped over his neck and the nose is kind of protruding uh, near his midsection. There's some sort of a small mammal hanging off this gentleman's back. Uh, he's got a, a garment uh, around his waist made out of deer skin and a necklace again with some small animal head. Another kind of cool thing is one half of his head is shaved and the other half is long. And that was a very typical hairstyle uh, of the indigenous people of our area. And that was basically designed to avoid the snap of the bowstring. If you're firing a bow that's as tall as you are, imagine the torque when that and the snap on that bowstring when you shoot an arrow. You wouldn't want your long hair to get caught in it. So a lot of times the, the men would have their head shaven on the right side and then would grow their hair long on the left. So that is a Susquehannock Indian warrior. Smith described them as a giant like people and thus attired. So were the Susquehannocks actually larger than your average Native American? The archeological record is still kind of unclear on that. Perhaps it was just that the Susquehannocks sent their largest, most impressive warriors to talk to Smith to intimidate him or to impress him. Uh, so the jury's still out on that one. All right, so going down to the lower right-hand corner of the map, uh, now we see the head of the bay. And down here you can see Captain John Smith's coat of arms. The rank captain is a military rank, not a naval rank, and he achieved the rank of captain while serving as a mercenary soldier fighting the Muslim Turks or in and around present day Hungary. And this is the coolest thing about this coat of arms. This is the detail I always tell classes of kids. Probably the most unique thing about Smith's coat of arms, you'll see three heads in the shield. And they're kind of facing, it's a profile with their noses to the left. They're all wearing turbans. Those represent three Turkish soldiers that Smith beheaded in one-on-one hand-to-hand -on -one, -hand combat before he ever set foot anywhere near the Chesapeake Bay. And at the bottom is his motto, Vincere est vivir, which means to conquer is to live. Smith was quite the warrior. Um, moving towards the lower middle of the map, he draws us a scale. So how long is the bay? He shows it in leagues, all right? So a league over land is equal to about three nautical miles or about 3.45 statute miles. Um, and he shows basically 15 leagues on his scale there. And when you align that with the main stem of the bay, he's right on the mileage that it actually is. He shows it as the bay's main stem being about 190 miles long if you use his key. And that's right, that's right on target. It's, it's really quite amazing. And you can see on the bottom, it says, discovered and described by Captain John Smith, 1606, graven by William Hole. Well, what does that mean? William Hole apparently was an engraver that Smith worked with to make this map. The way that publications were mass produced is you would literally make a, an etching into a plate of copper or wood, and then you would press that into some ink and then press that on a piece of paper, the printing press, right? Uh, so uh, William Hole is the artisan that worked with Smith to make the map. 1606 is the date that the Armada uh, actually left England for the Chesapeake Bay. I see a comment from former crew member Ken Niles. Ken, it's awesome to have you on the broadcast, man. Really appreciate it. All right, uh, what else, John? I think that might be it for all of sort of the visual details around the perimeter of the map. So what we'll do here next is we'll walk you up the main stem of the Chesapeake Bay. And one of the questions that people often ask is, where does that name come from, Chesapeake? And uh, to me, it's kind of a mystery. A lot of people have told me it's a Native American word that means Great Shellfish Bay, but uh, we really lost the Algonquin language. I don't know how people got that, but really to me, uh, the reason it's called the Chesapeake Bay is if you zoom in at the mouth of the bay above Cape Henry, there was a tribe called the Chesapeakes, and they were the first tribe that Europeans would have encountered had they come into the mouth of the bay and ducked out of a storm and set their anchor, for example. Um, and that word, Chesapeake, you'll see as we head from, remember here we're going from south to north, even though we're going like to the right. So you can see the word in three parts, che. So, another sea monster, Peak Bay. And then there's this little boat right up at the head. Look at that. Look at that little boat. See it? 
We believe that that is representative of a small open boat known as a shallop that John Smith used to glean a lot of the information on this map. A shallop was basically like, it was almost like the pickup truck of the Native American you know, world. So this might have been like a 25-ish foot open boat. This shows a boat with one mast and a little spar across the top, probably two sails, definitely oarlocks. We know from Smith's uh, journals that he basically was sailing and rowing. That's how they got around. Uh, so that's probably Smith's shallop. And then we see the head of the bay, which Smith shows up here, dividing into four rivers. Um, and he really, really nails it. He really nails it. So what the last thing we're going to do here is we're going to start at the mouth of the bay and kind of show you each river system that Smith mapped and what he called it and what we would call it today. So hopefully some of you guys are mariners and you're familiar with all this, but the first river down at the mouth of the Western, like when you come into the mouth of the bay and go to the Western shore, Smith called it the Powhatan flu, naming it after the Paramount chief. And uh, today we call that the James River. And you can see Jamestown is located you know, many miles up river. And they did that intentionally because they were really worried about the Spanish raiding up the river if they ever learned about the existence of Jamestown. The next river uh, Smith called the Pamunk flu or the Pamunky flu. Today we would call that the York River. Um, and what's really interesting about Pamunk or Pamunky is that at the head of the York River today, there are two Native American reservations. There's the Mattapanai Indian Reservation and there's also the Pamunky Indian Reservation. Those Native Americans still live right where they were when the first European settlers arrived in the Bay. Um, and a lot of people think that, you know, when Smith and the settlers arrived and tobacco starts to flourish, that the Indians kind of disappear from this region. That is absolutely false. There's plenty of Native American communities that still uh, are, are with us today, and they want us to know that, right? Uh, the next major river is the Tappahannock flu on the map. That is the modern day Rappahannock River. Here's a cool detail, freeze it right there, John. If you look at this, there's a really high density of Indian towns on the Rappahannock River. But if you look really carefully, you'll notice that almost every one of them is on the right hand or north side of the river. And there's virtually no Indians living on the south side of that river. Now, why is that? That is a really uh, bizarre little feature there. And in talking to archaeologists and anthropologists and people that study this, um, I think it's pretty widely accepted that those people were basically living in fear of Chief Powhatan. He would sometimes consolidate his power with lightning quick raids on other small communities. And so they basically wanted to put that river between themselves and Werewakamako and Powhatan and his warriors. All right, so moving on up the bay, we've got the Patawomic flu, which is today's modern Potomac River. Of course, uh, that is where present day Washington DC is located. Smith spent a lot of time uh, exploring this river, about a month actually. He probably went up river where this elbow is below the N in Powhatan. Uh, that is where the Anacostia River meets the Potomac River. And just to the right of that elbow is where Washington DC is located today. Uh, so just above the Potomac River, uh, another major sort of smallish but long river is the Patuxent River. So if you'll scroll down there, John, to the Patuxent, um, the Patuxent River is, uh, you know, we still basically use the word that Smith used on this map, but we've kind of Anglicanized the spelling a little bit. Uh, Smith found that the Patuxent was rich in, in villages. They were um, very good merchants. They were taking advantage of lush marshes and had a very rich trade-based uh, economy. So heading on up, Smith didn't really do the best job mapping some of these smaller rivers like the West River and the South River. The next major river he shows he calls the Bolus Flu. That is today's Patapsco River. An interesting detail here is you look around the Bolus Flu, left or right, there's no Native American communities anywhere on the map. And this really freaked out Smith and his men in 1608 when they were exploring up here because they were dependent on these Native American tribes to trade for food. And what people have surmised is that the Native Americans here had basically 
just kind of abandoned this land because there was this mysterious tribe called the Massawomics that were paddling down some of these rivers in birch bark canoes and almost like Vikings raiding the Indians on the Western shore. Um, and so, you know, basically if you're just getting raided and the people are coming down these rivers, you're gonna wanna cross the bay and put the bay between you and them, or you're gonna go up or down and get out of that territory. Um, so let's keep going, John, up to the head of the bay. Robbie Bear says, where was the artist from? I don't know that a whole lot is known about the artist that made this map. I do know this map was published in Oxford, England. Um, but I just, I don't think there's a whole lot of documentation about William Holy engraver. Never, never seen anything anyway. Um, the Willoughby's Flu is probably the Gunpowder River. Within the granddaddy of them all at the head of the bay, Smith called the, and the, it's tough to try to figure out how this would be pronounced, the Susquehannock Flu, which we today, again, have Anglicanized a little bit. We call that the Susquehanna River. When Smith gets to the mouth of the Susquehanna River, you know, one of the things he's trying to find is a water passage to Asia, sort of the, the fabled Northwest Passage. When he gets to like where present day Havre de Grace and Perryville are, and he sees this mile wide river with fresh water gushing down, obviously from a mountain range somewhere, he realizes pretty quickly that there is no Northwest Passage connecting the Chesapeake Bay to the waters of Asia. And that's a dream that doesn't die until Lewis and Clark are standing at the base of the Colorado mountains and they go, wow, there's a lot of mountains between us and the Pacific Ocean. Um, okay, so we'll keep going around. Uh, Gunter's Harbor, that is modern day Northeast River. Uh, for some reason, Smith opts not to name the river south of that, which we today would call the Elk and Bohemia River system. But he does draw the Takwa River. And this is kind of cool for people that live in, in Kent County because that is the modern day Sassafras River. So Smith shows a king's house, uh, probably near the present day location of the community of Kentmore Park. So if you're listening into this and you live in Kentmore Park, you are probably right on the same grounds as the king's house that Smith denotes for Takwa. And that, that sort of tributary to the right of the longhouse is probably Lloyd's Creek, big party spot in the summertime. All right, the next uh, king's house Smith shows is the Azanese or the Ozenes. We believe that that is located on the mouth of the Chester River. So imagine you're looking for a Northwest Passage and you see the mouth of the Chester River, that is trending south and east in the exact opposite direction of where you want to go. So Smith actually, unfortunately for me, living in Chestertown on the Chester River, he didn't go up the Chester, but he did kind of show the mouth of the river and the Azanese. And we know later there's records of a tribe living kind of near Quaker Neck Landing called the Wykamis, which may have been related to the Azanese. You can see the mouth, the, uh, the large islands that were in the middle of the bay, that's Kent Island, um, Tillman Island, Sharps Island, which is no longer there, which he didn't, he called them Winston's Isles. It must've been cool, you're going up the, the bay and you're just naming things after yourself and other people in your party. The next major river he shows is, he calls it the Cus Flu or the Cuscarawak Flu. That is the present day Nanticoke River. Um, and he shows a king's house in a little town called Cuscarawak. That is probably the location of present day Vienna, Maryland, which you pass by if you're going on Route 50 to the beach, you cross over the Nanticoke and the town of Vienna is right off there to your right. And so he went just beyond that, probably did cross into the state of Delaware, but barely. All right, coming on down, um, there's one more major river that Smith maps, which he called the Waiko Flu, which is short for Waikakamako. Uh, and that is the modern day Pocomoke River, right? Nice work, John Mann. And then heading down to the tip of Delmarva, there's two other king's houses that Smith showed, the Akahanic Indian tribe and the Akamak Indians. Um, the Akahanic actually have received state recognition from the state of Maryland, one of three tribes to do so. And Akamak is kind of neat because you can still go down to Virginia on the lower Delmarva and there's Akamak County. So a lot of these words, if you look at this map and kind of check out the words and the larger community Smith maps, the names of the rivers, a lot of these names from 1612 are still 
you know, reverberating on maps of the Bay today. All right, so let's go ahead and zoom out, John. And uh, so the last question we often get is, man, how did he know all this? How could he possibly have gotten this much information? So this is probably the riskiest technological move that we're going to make here. Uh, we're going to try to show you the routes of two voyages that Smith took in the summer of 1608, right? Um, so he leaves Jamestown on June 2nd, 1608, and he actually makes two distinct trips up the bay and basically goes up almost every major river system. And while he's doing this, he's again, he's taking compass bearings. He's using this thing called a chip log to measure the boat's speed, which then helps you calculate your distance. You can see on voyage one there, he did a lot of the lower eastern shore. This is voyage two. Getting a little herky-jerky here with our, uh, our internet speed, I think. But he basically goes to the head of the bay on voyage two and then maps the Rappahannock River, the Piankatank River, um, and fills in the blanks that he missed on voyage one. It's a little learning curve there. It looks like the... Um, Maybe our gigabyte speed isn't quite quite up. There we go. There we go. All right. Thank. Good job, John Smith. So he he basically spent about three and a half months in the summer of 1608 mapping all these rivers other than the James, which he explored extensively in 1607. So the last thing is, who cares? Why am I sitting here? Why have I talked to you now for 25 minutes about Captain John Smith's map? I can't overstate the importance of this map to the history, both the old history and the current history of this map. Um, prior to this map, as I said, uh, all, the, all the old maps, they just showed it as a little inlet. This map exponentially uh, improved upon those old maps and basically served as a guidepost for any English colonist that wanted to come and try to start a new life in the new world. Of course, in 1619, you get the first Africans arriving on the shores of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, within three generations, many of the Native American tribes have been displaced as the tobacco trade starts to flourish and the English get hungry for land. A lot of the Indians get driven off the land. So there's this incredible cultural ramification to this map. When the colony of Maryland is founded in 1632, they're carrying Smith's map, right? So this serves uh, basically as the opening of the floodgates for people to come here and all of a sudden they had a picture of where to go. And that has cultural ramifications, ecological ramifications, and really has, has this map helped shape the bay as we know it today. So how accurate was the map? Great question. Oh, I see Ann Stevens is watching from Kentmore Park. And go, go look for Takwa. It's probably right under the foundation of your house somewhere. But this blue, uh, sort, of, sort of bluish gray color, is, are the actual sort of satellite-based renderings of the shape of the bay. And John here has superimposed a modern, accurate map of the bay over Smith's attempt. Think about this guy is in a basically a 25-foot rowboat in the middle of a Chesapeake summer with limited food supplies, with rudimentary navigational tools. It's just, it's incredible how close he got. Um, if you've ever done any boating on the Chesapeake, a small boat. You go down to Dorchester County. It's very disorienting. It's a very monochromatic horizon. The fact that he was able to map almost every major river and just even down to like little bends in the rivers, uh, sometimes while he's being shot at by Indians that weren't particularly friendly because they just didn't know who he was or what his intentions were. Gunter's Harbor. I see Rob Gunter. Rob, that harbor might be named after you. I'm not sure who Gunter is. I don't know of a Gunter on the voyage. So that is a question that I'm going to have to do a little more research on. It's so awesome to see people uh, flinging in some questions here. Are there any other questions from the audience? Was John Smith a member of the nobility? There's a question along the bottom. That's a great question. No. And that kind of is a unique part of Smith's story. He was the son of a sort of a middle-class yeoman farmer. And you got to remember at this time in England, if you weren't born into nobility, you were not a noble. It was almost like a caste system, right? So pretty early in life, kind of like some modern kids that aren't born into like riches, Smith saw the military as a way to improve his status in life. He became a mercenary soldier. He fought against the Spanish. 
He uh, traveled across Eastern Europe. Again, he fought the Turks. And that's really where, again, he earned his coat of arms and uh, like a, an award for, for valor in the field. And that's really kind of where he earned his stripes. Yeah, so there's, there's a Rappahannock River on the Eastern shore as well. That is, don't be confused with the Rappahannock. There's also three Wicomico rivers on this map as well, which is also kind of confusing. Uh, you know, it would really be cool if we had translations of the Algonquin language, because why Kakamako? Maybe that just meant this place, or who knows? Uh, but the reason Smith was able to glean a lot of this vocabulary is because during his captivity in 1607, remember we showed you Powhatan's court earlier, he spent several months living amongst the native tribes and was able to learn just enough of their language that he was his own translator uh, for most of his stay. Uh, what year was the map printed? Great question. The first year the map was printed was 1612, but this map was in continuous use for over 100 years. It, actually, I don't know if, John, if you could zoom in on our map. This is kind of a neat story. When we, uh, Sultana Education Foundation, we built a reproduction of Smith Shallop, and we reenacted his voyage in the summer of uh, 2007. And we put the word out that, hey, if anybody has a high resolution version of Smith's map, could you bring it to us? We'd love to scan it and really get the details. And so a gentleman came in and he just so happened to have what he believed was kind of like a, an actual printing from the 17th century. And in the upper, I think right hand corner, John Mann, is a date that we believe that he believed this map was printed. And I think the date is like 1692. Yeah, see it up there? So this map, it, the first printing was in 16, 12, 1693. Uh, we believe that the, the scan of this map that we got Bob Ramsey to do for us at the finishing touch was perhaps from, an, uh, not the original 1612, but a, a print run from 1693. Who sponsored and paid for the voyage? Um, did he get a land grant from mapping the bay? No, that's a great question. Uh, this is all part of the Virginia Company of London's efforts to establish a permanent settlement on the James River, well, in the Chesapeake Bay, and to make riches for investors. So Smith, making this map, was basically a company man working for the Virginia Company of London, whereas Augustine Herman, and it's great that you brought up his name, because the map that supersedes Smith's map is published in 1673. It's done by a gentleman named Augustine Herman, who was contracted out as an individual by the Calvert family. And he spent 10 years mapping the base. So Smith basically, you know, he maps the James River throughout his voyages in 1607. He spends the summer of 1608 going up most of the bay's main stem. Augustine Herman spent 10 years sailing up every creek and he really nails the bay. Uh, and he got a huge land grant in Cecil County and when you go up and you can actually drive over the Bohemia River and to the left is a building called Bohemia Manor. And that's kind of was Augustine Herman's stomping grounds. And if you were to go on that drive, you would be on Augustine Herman Highway. Why was there no third expedition? Did John believe he'd fully mapped the big great question, Ken Niles? I knew I could count on you. Uh, I think Smith did. He knew that he had reached the head of the bay. He knew that he had gone up every Western shore river trending north and west, and he'd gone to the headwaters of each one of them. He knew there was no Northwest passage. So there really was no reason for him to do a third voyage. And additionally, in 1609, Smith is sailing on the James River and apparently a spark ignited a, a pack of black powder that he had on his belt and blew like a nine inch diameter hole into his thigh. And he basically barely survived. He jumped off the little boat he was on. He almost drowned. He got, he, 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 this guy had like nine lives. And then he was essentially compelled to sail back to England. Here's a cool thing you might not have known about John Smith. He comes back to North America. And in 1616, he makes the first accurate, decently accurate map of the New England coastline. And he names New England, New England. So when, you know, Plymouth is established, they're using a Smith map up there as well. The guy was just incredibly influential. All right, any other questions? Really cool that you guys are still with me after 37 minutes. I know it's your Thursday night and you're free to do whatever you want. So we appreciate your time with us.
Anything else? John Mann, fire off a fake question. This is the last one. When did Native Americans first arrive in the Chesapeake region? That is still being debated today, uh, at least 14,000 years. And there's some tantalizing evidence that it might even be longer than that. So you got to remember when Smith and the, the, the English from Jamestown show up at Jamestown, they are entering a world that the indigenous people had already lived in for thousands of years. So we think of him as this great discoverer. He was basically just rediscovering territory that these Indians had been living on for many, many generations. Somebody says, this was awesome. Looking forward to learning more. Thank you so much. That's great to hear. And that's a great segue into Sultana sessions because our next session is one that we're really, really excited about. It'll be on Thursday, March 18th, 7 p.m. Great, great couple of guest stars. Thanks, Carolina. Hope you'll join us then. We're out. Thank you so much.